Um, thank you very much for inviting me to be here to present um, my understanding of the COVID-19 control and public health practice in China. Can I control my slide myself here? Hello? Can I share slide myself here? Sure, you can, Professor. Okay, I will share the slide. It's better than, you know, you control the slide. Oh, okay, here it is. So I will share the, you know, COVID-19 control, the public health practice in China. So obviously, as everybody knows, the COVID-19 is still in the pandemic stage at the moment, all over the world. You know, it's still a very serious problem. So the key question is here, why and how we got this COVID-19? So obviously, there's a lot of, uh, you know, Zoomers and uh, infodemics and um, suspected, you know, this could be a man-made and this is a, could be a lab leak whatsoever. However, when you look at what we have for the last decades, we have so many emerging infectious diseases arising, you know, almost every year, you know, you have something new coming out. So this is what I wrote in, 19, uh, in 2018, the journal cell with a commentary, something after we got all this, after we got the uh, um, Zika virus um, in, you know, Asia and uh, Southeast, uh, South uh, America. So, so obviously, you know, we are, we are facing so many emerging and emerging viruses here. Sorry, I don't know what happened. And uh, if you look at the coronavirus, though we are having COVID-19, but look at back, you know, when you 2002, we have SARS first emerging in 2002 in Guangdong province, China, and then, you know, spread all over China, and then you will some sporadic cases in other countries. And then, you know, thinking back, uh, the first human infecting coronavirus, it was h cov 229E, found in 1965. And then two years later, we have another one, h cov OK 43 So this is the third coronavirus infecting human beings. Of course, in 2004, we have AR-63, Meanwhile, we also have a HK1. You know, this is a five coronavirus since 1965 infecting human beings. We always think, where are those virus from? So origins of the virus are very important for the control for the future disease X. However, if you look at back, the HK1 was first isolated in Hong Kong by Dr. Kai Wang Yue in Hong Kong University. This is why it's called HK1. And uh, retro retrospectively, in um, Brazil, the virus was in the, you know, in the freezer, uh, in some samples in the freezer, it found in 1995. So obviously, you know, of the origin of the virus is a typical, definitely everybody is seeing, it's a, it is a scientific question. Of course, MERS emerged 2012. Of course, now we have COVID-19. You know, this is some, give you some example. Recently, I wrote something in the Lancet, describing something about the origins of the HIV, MERS, uh, SSTSV, uh, and also, you know, for the HK1. So obviously you can see the virus can be found as early as decades before first outbreak. When you look at back, so can human beings finally control the any pandemic or the virus? We are lucky enough. The smallpox was eradicated by using the vaccination. So the good example for the vaccination could play a very good important role for eradicate the virus is smallpox. Of course, by vaccination, human beings, we also eradicate the second um, animal viruses. This is regular pest. So so far, by vaccination, human eradicated two viruses. That's a very big um, 
achievement for the human beings by using science. I heard something about the science play a very important role early morning when Lin Fa Wang gave a talk, um, you know, early, 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 early morning. Of course, uh, polio. Polio is eliminated in most of the countries. We only have uh, a few countries now still have uh, polio, but most of the countries already eradicated this uh, polio. So this is very good news for all the human beings. However, we also have serious problems uh, for other viruses. Uh, for example, we don't have any um, we don't have any vaccines even developed for HIV. So we, we you know we still need to work, need to work very hard to get an HIV vaccines. So now, why do we have COVID nineteen? Is COVID nineteen appearing? Is it, is it a green rhino event or black swan um, event? I want to remind you. I was invited by the Johns Hopkins University plus World Bank, um, World Bank Forum, and also the Gates Foundation in uh, 2019, October 18th. I was in New York. There they have a um, uh, event 201. There uh, we suppose we have an animal. Uh, we have an anime. The anime we call it as uh, calves. Coronavirus associated pneumonia syndrome. Look at the name. The name sounds, it's really, you know, this is a virus. What kind of virus? It is uh, COVID 19. So they, we supposed there is a virus coming out from the pigs, a swine in Brazil, and then transmitted to uh, human beings, and then it's transmitted to uh, USA, eventually to China. So we have this uh, um, event and uh, sit here together, um, obviously that also tells you the coronavirus is, could be very serious. So this is why I was a member for the GPMB, Global Preparedness Monitoring Board. The our 2090 annual reports claiming flu, coronavirus are the most important or most uh, likely virus is causing pandemic in the human beings, but we are not ready. We are not ready for this possible or potential uh, pandemic. So in 2016, my group wrote a, a review in transient microbiology, claiming it is likely not a matter of if, but when the next recombinant cough, coronavirus, will emerge and cause another uh, outbreak in the human population. So obviously for the professionals, we already know their there might be a new coronavirus coming out to infect human beings, which might cause a pandemic. But to the ordinary people, maybe they think, you know, this is really a, a black swan. So early 2020, by the end of uh, 2019, we noticed there is there is some, there are some uh, pneumonia of an unknown etiology, PUE patients in Wuhan. And uh, we immediately collect the data and uh, we did the sequencing. We developed the, the diagnosis case. We, the whole genome sequencing, we isolated the virus and the virus was uh, sequencing was shared by 10th January through the GISA, you know, this GISA global initiative for sharing all your present data. So, there, you know, we uh, shared all the secrets. And this is why by using size, now we, immediately we have all this vaccine under development. Uh, of course, and Dr. Chen Wang and me, we wrote something in the Lancet, published in Jan on January 24th. We claiming a, car a novel coronavirus outbreak of global health concern. There, we already claimed it could be a global concern. You know, joint authors, including Peter Hobby from Oxford and Fred um, uh, Hayden from Virginia. Of course, after that, you remember on March 27th, I was interviewed by science, I, you know, calling for the um, non-pharmaceutical intervention method, especially for wearing the uh, mask to, to, get the, to get the COVID-19 control. So why and how 
regard to our state of the movement in China. We always have zero clearance strategy. You know, after Wuhan outbreak, we after you know really it's a, um, uh, closing down the whole country and the economy as well for the social mobility. Uh, then you know, we have the clean uh, field in China. We don't have any more virus um, circulating inside China. However, from time to time, we always have a lot of imported cases. With those imported cases, we have some community level transmission. So why China, you know, so far, we still can get the zero clearance strategy working in China because we have a very good community level public health base. So this is very, very important. I was invited by the Atlantic Public Health, you know, try to see something about the public health practice inside China. I'm claiming strengthening public health at the community level in China. So which are the key for the prevention and control of the central pandemic? I think, you know, by what kind of experience or uh, experience we can learn uh, is, you know, try to strengthen your community level public health facility. This is very important. This is the, also the key for China's strategy, uh, control strategy. So I show you that, the, could, could you give you a very good example? In China, we are doing some whack a mole or we try to suppress the spring, you know, the spring, not like the lake, you know, most of the country, you have a lake. And in China, we have a spring. Whenever we have this water coming out, we try to suppress it. So, so far it works. Or in China at the moment, we still can calculate for well, this look with local transmission after we had an outbreak. We have roughly less than 40 outbreaks with local transmission after imported cases. Like we have clear waves. You look at this, it's clear waves. And by the, all, the rest of the world, you have a tsunami. Once you have this tsunami, it will be very difficult. I believe what we have been doing at the moment in China will set up another good example for the modern public health control strategy and why and how China can get this zero clearance strategy work. Um, you know, we need to think about it. So of course you need a lot of uh, um, investment. Uh, you need a lot of uh, size-based strategy and also you need a very important for the public understanding, public involvement, public public power compartment of the any, you know, uh, strategies, any tactics. And most importantly, you need a very strong leadership for the, you know, decision making authority to do something. So three steps, science-based, public understanding and compartment and authority um, decision making. So this is, you know, what I think is very important. So looking back, uh, what kind of, you know, we wrote some papers for uh, the Lancet, we called active case finding with case management, the key to tackle the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is how we get the Wuhan outbreak done. And also we, well, we outlined what we have done in China. We called it 100 days of coronavirus disease, 2019 prevention control in China, publishes clinical infectious diseases last year. So for early, so early, Diagnosis, early report, and uh, um, early um, early treatment, uh, early isolation is very, very important. At the moment, we try to suppress the imported cases, and we try to suppress any you know uh, emerging out, uh, uh, outbreaks with uh, local transmission. Of course, the NPI, not pharmaceutical intervention measures in China. Um, Dr. Tony Fauci uses three W's, wearing the mask, watching the distance, washing the hands. They are, you know, very, very important strategies uh, uh, to be impl implemented uh, in practice. So this is very important. Of course, the next step is very important to have the vaccines. Let me give you an overview what we have or what kind of strategies at the moment in the whole world for the vaccine development. In general, we have seven strategies in the whole world. Of course, the first one is inactivated vaccine. It's known 
is in India and China, we are mainly using the inactivated vaccine, a live attenuated vaccines. For that, we haven't got any vaccine in clinical trials yet, but it's under um, investigation. Of course, protein-based, uh, protein subunit vaccine is also under development in China, including my group. We have the first protein subunit vaccine used in China and in Uzbekistan. Uh, you know, developed by my uh, my group and approved by the Chinese uh, FDA. Of course, viral vector. Virus vector vaccines get clearly, you know, is an adenovirus vector. Of course, another one for spring, you know, nasal uh, spring vaccines under development at the moment in China is influenza, influenza virus based. And the DNA vaccine and mRNA vaccine, everybody knows that because we are discussing something about public health we are discussing about digital public health. We are discussing about AI technologies for the future of the public health. It's very, very important I want to address. mRNA technology for the first time to be used for the healthy population. They opened really a great deal of the doors for any potential disease control, disease therapy, prophylactic and therapeutics. So this includes not only for the um, infectious diseases, but also for the cancers, for the rare diseases, for the genetic disorders. I want to ask everybody here to pay more attention for the mRNA technology. Of course, last one, virus-like particles, nanoparticle virus um, vaccine. So this is very, very important uh, seven strategies under development at the moment for the coronavirus vaccines. Uh, in the whole world. And how we design this? Look at the virus itself. You know, it's a corona. You have a spike protein embedded on the virus sur surface. You, of course, you have the genome here, you have the vaccine, you have the nuclear acid here. Then you, if you pick the spike protein out, this is spike protein. They have S1, S2. In the S1, you have a so-called receptor binding domain, RBD. So the RBD can be used as a dimer, either trimeric one, like BioNTech, Pfizer design, or mRNA vaccine, or dimeric uh, RBD vaccine, like what we developed in our group. Um, it is used at the moment in China, developed by Zhifei local uh, biopharmaceutical companies. And of course, you have modified S protein. So in general, this is the whole strategy for the vaccine develop development. So in China, at the moment, we have, as I mentioned, five technical routes, and we have uh, nine products. Uh, or no, of course, we already have nine. Uh, seven of them are already in the clinical use. We still have some in the clinical trials. You know, really, um, we call the saturated vaccine development and property in China. That gives a very good chance to, to you know, uh, to fit what we need in the society. This will give you some examples about our uh, uh, vaccines. Um, this is phase three clinical trials and the United vaccines, um, adenovirus vaccine, all these give you very good protection. Of course, not 100%. This is the public would expect. They, they are expecting we have a 100% pro, uh, VE vaccine, effectiveness vaccine, but you know, it's not there. So COVID-19 uh, um, so situation at the moment, really have some impact for vaccination in China, uh, or in the whole world. Um, in many countries, they have 60 or 50% of the vaccination coverage. But you know, uh, after that, it's very hard because of the vaccination uh, hesitancy. Vaccis vaccine hes hesitancy is a general problem in the whole world, and including in China. But China is good. At the moment, we have 1.1 um, billion uh, population already vaccinated. Um, you know, uh, uh, think about such a big population in China. In China, from the very beginning, we tried to do the stratified uh, policy. You know, first we tried to the emergency use uh, for some special populations. Then we use some called target populations. For example, someone working on the bottle control, someone working in a special. Um, um, specialized uh, uh, jobs, and of course, and then we get to the stage two for the high risk people, our uh, well, population, including elderly, uh, and the persons with underlying conditions, 
Of course, uh, then we come to other populations, rest of the 80 years. We almost done here at the moment. Um, of course, we, we started to vaccinate with um, um, uh, uh, population between 12 to 18. So, so far, you know, it works well. And um, up to July 19th, and China, this is the old figure. I, I already mentioned, I don't want to go through this old figure anymore, but look at the working method. And in China, I put them into these six first you had vaccination services, well-led professional teams, administration, um, administration uh, focused and the fast growing vaccination capacity, uh, reduce vaccine hesitancy with communications. So communication is very important. Of course, AEFI safety is sure. We set up coordinated by China CDC for the AEA5 surveillance. And um, this is to give you an uh, example. You know, we try to use the, all these stadium, all these uh, uh, mobile, mobile, mobile buses, and to, you know, implant it, all this vaccination program in China, you know, works very well at the moment. Um, of course, that with this AEFI, we have a very good centralized uh, system um, and try to capture all these possible um, AEFIs. Of course, you know, from the very beginning, uh, our president Xi Jinping called the vaccine should be a global um, uh, public goods. Um, you know, this is why uh, from the very beginning, we always uh, uh, publish many guidelines uh, for the vaccination for all these uh, uh, programs. Um, this is, um, I'll give you some uh, examples, progress in you know, the, the whole world. It, uh, generally speaking, the progress very, uh, very well. Of course, while we are working so hard for the vaccination program, we are facing new variants. I think we already discussed this for the first session this morning. And uh, so we have so many names. Variants are the investigation, variants of interest, variants of concern, variants of high um, consequence. Then there is some suspect. With all those variants, will the vaccine under development or under clinical use work for those with so many, especially for those variants of concern? Well, look at the real world data. I show you this real world data I borrowed from the publication. You know, when you have the second wave in the UK, this is the ratio frequency of the uh, cases from day one to 50. This is uh, um, um, cases for death cases. You know, you have, you know, the rates very similar. You have that number for the uh, um, units or positive, you have that number for deaths. But when you do the third wave in the UK, you have so many cases, but the death cases lower down. So this is why vaccine for vaccination, you have four levels. First, preventing from infection. Second, preventing from um, illness. Third, preventing from transmission. A third, preventing from serious condition or death. Obviously, the vaccination program works so well for the control of death cases. Uh, this is the US. Uh, figure also copied from a publication you can see and uh, uh, the purple here uh, in different states tells you the numbers of uh, infections, uh, the infections uh, from unvaccinated and the yellow uh, part here with small numbers they are from the vaccinated uh, group so obviously that has, it works our vaccine works very well um, this is a uh, CoronaVac um, developed uh, in our uh, Sinovac uh, and also by Sinopharm to give you, you know, the numbers you see. Uh, in general, it works very well. And the Sinovac vaccine in Brazil, Chile, very good results. Um, and BIBP, that's a biopharm bio bio uh, in Beijing and uh, from Bagrim. And they also, you know, give you the very good data. So in general, 
all these vaccine is effective. We obviously uh, the number keep tells you it works well. This is give you uh, the USA and the UK, uh, Israel and also UK. Also, you know, uh, they all these real world data tells you works well. So finally, what I would call, you know, for all this, um, we have so many vaccines, but it's concentrated to the developed countries. We are calling for the vaccine sharing in the world. So I'm seeing here, if the world don't share the vaccine, the virus will share the world. So this is why, you know, I'm calling, we should do work together to share the vaccines. So to do this, and to share our idea, follow our President Xi Jinping's call for international public goods, and China already, you know, to contribute a lot for sharing, and also want to share the WHO, share the CEPI. You know, they are doing very well for the vaccine sharing. And um, here, I also want to share with you the future for the disease X, the future for the control of a pandemic. I am kept asking, uh, being asked by someone, George, can we really get you know, rid of all these uh, uh, viruses in the future? And are we ready for next pandemic? Well, viruses and humans, what's the relationship? The relationship of what, what, what virus and humans, we are like a Tom and Jerry story. You know, it's really a, Tom Jerry um, story. So you have you you eradicated the smallpox and reader press, and then you have HIV. You get HIV under control. You have a SARS, and then you have a COVID nineteen. I think we are facing so many virus in the future. So we will have the virus COVID nineteen will be a flu like virus. This virus eventually, because we cannot get it, we cannot get it eradicated. It will be very hard to get this virus eliminated. So we will have the virus as either epidemic in some region or endemic in some special region, or we will, it will be seasonal, like seasonal flu. That's, you know, could be a serious problem. Of course, for the COVID-19, we still have so many scientific questions to be answered, pathogenesis. So this is why we are discussing something about long COVID-19. So for the long COVID, we really need to invest for the basic scientific research. Are we have, have we another virus? Yes, we will have another sister brother virus like COVID-19. And it could be COVID XY, COVID-20 something, COVID-30, or it could be SARS-CoV-3, SARS-CoV-4, or other, you know, it's a coronavirus, but nothing to do, it's not really closely related to the uh, SARS. So, by the end, what we should do for the sustainable development in the whole world, uh, also for the resilience, we should work together for the one health, do the best for the ecology. And also human beings, we should behave ourselves, try to protect for the climate change, protect our ecology and protect our society. So we need work together. While we are talking about public health, we are talking about AI technology. We are talking about digital public health. Look at what happened with the COVID-19 pathogen, SARS-CoV-2. It expands its territories for the hosts. This is the hosts are listed here. This is a paper just published, written by me and my colleague in China CDC Weekly. So you know, this virus expands the host to so many, so many hosts. And in the lab, we already know the virus would infect so many species. So you can imagine the COVID-19 or the SARS-CoV-2 virus will expand more hosts. And we got to work together to not only work for the human health, but also for the um, animal health and also for the protection of our environment. So keep one health in our mind and that's our future. I think, of course, we have a bright future, 
but we got to work together very hard. Keep the solidarity, solidarity, and solidarity. Thank you very much. I will stop here, ready to discuss with everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much for the keynote address, Prof Gao. We have collected a few questions for Prof Gao. The first question is, with the pace of variant mutation of COVID-19, how is the research community reacting and what is the pressure on researchers in adapting vaccine delivery within safe protocols and booster coverage? That is a very good question. To answer this question first, remember, though we have so many variants, or we also have some more coming out, but SARS-CoV-2 is still SARS-CoV-2. The virus has some variant, but it's called a virus. It's not a new virus. Our vaccine under development or under clinical use will for sure work. Second, scientists and the public health workers, we are working very hard to develop some new vaccine to try to cover the uh, protection of the variant. So far, you know, most of the vaccines still work very well for the variants. You know, we, we have some reduction of the protection of VE vaccine, FD vaccine is, but it is still working. Of course, we should think about the booster uh, jab. Uh, that's, you know, everybody's talking about this and with uh, enough vaccines, some countries already started with, with the first, a booster jab. A third um, line I want to say for this question, bear in mind, we have to answer some basic, basic scientific questions. For example, so this is the, you know, learn the effective virus and whether or not you have very good antibody, it will work uh, for your lung infection. That's like the flu. It's, we have so many scientific questions to be answered. But so far, so good. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. The second question is, the race between vaccination and variants, how to stay ahead? Um, yes, that's a very good question. How to stay ahead? Of course, you know, because the accumulation of the scientific knowledge and we are the ahead of the, uh, you know, pandemic, you know, of course, people say, well, you know, we already have a pandemic, why still you, you are saying we are ahead because of the scientific contribution, you know, because uh, we, the human beings, you, we invest a lot for the scientific research, you know, this is why, although we have a pandemic, uh, as, as I mentioned, you know, for, to control this pandemic, it's not a matter of the science. Or vaccination, it's a matter of the whole society. You know, the last session we discussed something about the resilience of the human beings. It's a, you know very complicated cases. However, keep investing in the basic research. We will be ahead of the variants. So, so many uh, new vaccines uh, tackling the variants already under clinical trials, or some of the already in clinical trials. Um, you know, for example, with the combination of the uh, variant, one of the variants with the uh, protocol, prototype uh, virus, uh, it's already, you know, in some uh, phase one clinical trials. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. The third question is, Do you foresee at some point in the future that China will use a different strategy than zero COVID? That is a very, very good question. I think we have already started to discuss this. Um, I think now uh, uh, to answer this question, I put it into two parts. The first part, to, uh, so far we have adapted the a zero clearance strategy, it helps us to save a lot of time for the vaccine development, to save a lot of time for the communications with the public. This is to avoid the euphodemic. You know, euphodemic could be also a very serious problem. And also to avoid uh, the potential um, uh, serious uh, or death cases. So that's good so far. And the second question, if 
uh, and, and, and if the virus will be here on the earth, we will open our border with the rest of the world. I think we might, I still use the might. So far, we are doing so well. With I, I, No one would believe, you know, with this modern technology, China can really can achieve such a zero clearing strategy working, still keep the society and the economy running. You look at the economy and the society is still running. Of course, you know, you can see, you know, one, two, three, a lot of disadvantages, but in general, I mean, look at what happened here. So the second point I want to say, China made a great contribution for the modern public health strategy. Let's wait and see. I think we, under such a pandemic, in the whole world, we all use this dynamic, um, resi resilient strategy uh, everywhere in the world. You know, from time to time, you heard some countries starting another lockdown. So let's wait. I think that's something that could be China's choice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. The fourth question is, in your opinion, how should China prepare for possible COVID-19 and influenza virus circulation this coming winter? Um, we have already um, done some of these preparations last year because last winter, we also, you know, prepared ourselves to have um, both influenza and COVID-19. Because of this non-pharmaceutical intervention, APIs, strategy, three Ws, wearing the mask, watching the distance, and washing the hands, and it works very well uh, last year for the control of the flu. You know, we do have a flu in China this year. First, by encouraging the flu vaccination uh, and COVID-19 vaccination. And uh, the second, by still encouraging people to do follow these uh, three Ws, APIs, especially for wearing the mask. I think, you know, um, we are expecting to have some, but definitely like what happened last year, it will be under control. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. The fifth question is, how much do you understand about the variants and unpredictable probable mutations? Um, so far, as you can see, we have already have, you know, I hope we still have enough Greek letter to be used for all the new variants. Um, you know, you, you, in my opinion, in general, the variants can be divided into two categories. One category, that you have the variants, they increase the transmissibility, but decrease the um, fatality. Um, fatality, and um, and also increase the um, uh, and also you know increase the binding to a receptor. Um, you know that's a very good example for the Delta variant. And the second uh, group or category would be some uh, something like Gamma and uh, Beta. Uh, those viruses they reduce the binding to a receptor, and uh, they decrease for the transmissibility, but they neutralize the antibodies, the titers with the, the neutralizing antibodies also, you know, uh, less effective to those um, category uh, variants. So then there's a balance for the virus to survive for the, our, from our immune system. So, so far, what we have like the Delta is example. You know, you have a higher transmissibility, but the vaccine still works well because they still want to keep the virus as its virus, as SARS-CoV-2. And some virus like the beta and gamma, and from the very beginning when we saw it, we were very worried, but by the end of the day, you know, the virus still is of that virus, it didn't spread all over the world, not like, unlike the Delta. So for see the future, I think they still will you know, go through those three categories, uh, those two categories. Um, in general, 
I'm a little bit optimistic. So our vaccine will still have some percentage of protection, high, pro, high percentage of protection. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. The sixth question is, Hi, Prof. What is your opinion on rostered routine testing for COVID-19 in asymptomatic patients? Sorry, I didn't hear this question. Oh, about asymptomatic uh, patients. Correct. Uh, yeah, you might, you know, in my opinion, um, let, like I said, if the virus will survive with the human beings, uh, what the value for the asymptomatic infection um, nuclear exit test, I think we need to re-evaluate for that. That reassessment should be started by now. Uh, if the virus, like I said, transmissibility increase and the fatality decreased, and we have so many asymptomatic infections, we might think about uh, reduce the nuclear gas tests. So I think that should also be the dynamic. We should put that one as a dynamic, dynamic topic for discussing in the future for our strategy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. The seventh question is, impressive work and incredible efforts by China in controlling COVID-19 transmission and keeping China safe. As no one is safe until everyone is safe, many countries have decided to live with COVID-19 because of huge economic burden and livelihood of population. China still has a zero COVID strategy with very strict border control and quarantine requirements at this moment. What is the strategy for China COVID-19 control moving forward, especially when China opens up border again? Uh, I think uh, we, we already touched a little bit uh, on this question earlier, in our in the earlier questions. Um, as I said earlier, I think we are discussing about the um, um, new strategy in China. Of course, as I said, everything is dynamic. You know, even in China, um, you know, in detailed strategies and tactics, we have modified a lot. You know, look at it from the very beginning. And, you know, this is why we are the eighth uh, edition for this prevention and control of COVID-19. Uh, for the guideline and uh, the pro national protocols. Um, I think, you know, in the future, um, as I said earlier, we already saved the time for the live scene, uh, waiting for the vaccine development and waiting for the, all those, you know, um, facilities ready. I think we already saved the time. I think we are ready for any possible reassessment of the strategy. Thank you, Prof. The last question is, as COVID-19 is unlikely to go away anytime soon, are we ready to declare COVID-19 as an endemic? We are not ready yet to claim COVID-19 as an endemic because at the moment it's still pandemic. At the moment, it still causes very high fatality. At the moment, and psychologically, our public are not ready. You know, if you want to live peacefully with any virus like we have in our body, CMV, EBV, HSV, those you know, herpes virus, uh, if we want to get you to that stage, we also need psychologically the public ready. So it is a quite complicated question. It is a quite complicated case. And, you know, we really need to combine the several of the, you know, um, factors together and then to say for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. This marks the end of the keynote address. Please join me 
and thanking Professor George Gao once again for the very engaging speech.